Second Peter chapter 2, if you remember, we were talking about uh, specifically verses 15 and 16, and we were looking at a man in the Old Testament by the name of Balaam. Uh, the Bible says, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, loved the wages of unrighteousness. What does that mean? He what? He loved evil and the money that came with it. And of course, uh, we see that all over our world right now, right? And then he said in verse 16 that, that Balaam was rebuked for his iniquity. What is iniquity? Sin. Sin. He was rebuked for his sin. The Bible says the dumb ass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. And we were looking at Numbers, the book of Numbers, and I ask you to turn back there. Uh, we were talking about Numbers chapter 23, and we were looking at the actual event. I'm sorry, did I say 23? 22, Numbers 22. We were looking at the event that is reported that led up to this. And you remember that the background of this, the children of Israel are uh, fleeing from the land of Egypt, they come into the coast of, a, of the plains of Moab, and uh, instead of being kindly received and entreated, we remember the king Balak decided that he wanted to call Balaam down and curse the people of God. And of course, uh, we read that chapter, and we looked at all that was involved in uh, this cursing that uh, God would not allow Balaam to do. He, he, Balak said, curse him, and God said, what? No, you're going to bless him. You're, you're not going to curse them. And so uh, in chapter 23, Balaam said in verse number 1 to Balak, build me here seven altars and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak, and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And Balaam said to Balak, Stand by thy burnt offering, and I will go for adventure. The Lord will come to meet me, and whatsoever he showeth me, I will tell thee. And the Bible says in verse 3, He went up to a high place. And God met Balaam and said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have uh, offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And in verse 5, the Bible says the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth. Uh, God is going to use Balaam to speak for him, and God actually gives him the words that he's going to speak. Now, we, we often refer to that process as the process of inspiration, where God actually puts the words into the person, and that person speaks his word. Uh, this is what normally takes place when a prophet of God speaks. Now, Balaam is not a prophet of God. Uh, we've already pointed out from 2 Peter chapter 2 that he was a man who loved the wages of unrighteousness. So he is not a prophet of God in the normal sense, but God is going to use him and as one of his prophets to speak to Balak. So he said in verse 5, Return unto Balak, and thus shalt thou speak. And he, and he returned unto him, and lo, he stood by his burnt offering or burnt sacrifice. He, all, he and all the princes of Moab, notice verse 7, he took up his parable. When you, when you see that word parable, what do you normally think of? Okay, an illustration. Uh, if, if you look at the word, and, and we've talked about this before, uh, the word parable actually is a combination of two Greek words. Para, which means alongside of. You see it in the word parallel. And then you've got balo, which is to throw. So the, the most uh, strenuous definition would be to throw alongside of. Right beside. And so what God does in giving parables, it's usually 
an earthly illustration, but it has spiritual meaning. But this word parable in, in this text is dealing more with the word that we often hear the word proverb. Proverb. And the word proverb, we think of the book of Proverbs, where it's that short, pithy statement that has a powerful truth. This is the word that is actually used here. And so we could say that he spoke a proverb and said, verse 7, Balak, the king of Moab, had brought me from Amram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. I want you to listen carefully to verse 8. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed, or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? Now, Paul's right there. What is his point? What is he saying? How am I going to curse the people that God has not cursed? Well, we know you can curse in reality anybody, but does that change what God is going to do? No, it doesn't change what God does at all. But now, Balaam is saying, how am I going to curse this people that God has blessed? Listen carefully to verse 9. And this is a beautiful statement from Balaam. He says, for from the tops, or excuse me, from the top of the rocks, I see him, and from the hills I behold him. Lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. What does he say in verse 9? Okay, God's people stand alone. They don't need help. He says, from the top of the rocks, I look down and I see the people of God and I see them standing alone. They're not going to be numbered among those nations that are around about them. Now, we often talk about Romans 15, 4 when we're in the Old Testament. These things were written for our learning. What, what do you think God would have us learn from this proverb that Balaam spoke about the Old Testament people of God how does it apply to us as New Testament Christians? We're separated from the world. We're a peculiar people, I think Peter says. That's exactly right. We are a peculiar people. You remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14, Paul says to the New Testament church, Come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing. God's people today... We are the people of God, and and, and I, I'm not trying to be ugly, but we shouldn't be intermingling with all the religious groups that are out there just because they claim some allegiance to the Bible, some allegiance to Christ, but then they turn around and deny the very church that Jesus purchased with his own blood. Yeah. And so he said, you come on out from among them and be separate. Don't touch the unclean thing. And God says, I will be unto you a father. You shall be my sons and my daughters. And so, brethren, this statement of Balaam, God's people in the Old Testament were not numbered among the nations. And brethren, we understand God's people today not, not numbered among the nations that we see around us. And, and, and just to be clear, we're talking about the Nama nations, <laughs> okay? We're not a part of that. We are the people of God. And so he says in verse 10, Who can count the dust of Jacob and the number of the fourth part of Israel? I, I love what he said in verse 10. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. You know what's sad? about that statement. Balaam died with the Moabites. When the children of Israel conquered the promised land, he didn't die as a righteous man. He died among the heathen. He died among the Moabites. And the children of Israel, the Bible tells us, slew him with a sword. So this Balaam, 
you can tell God, and, and I've said this before, and it's ruffled feathers, but, but I don't know how else to say it. God is speaking through Balaam. Balaam is choice in what his words are. Just like that donkey. When God spoke through that donkey, that ass, that ass was God's mouthpiece, right? Mm -hmm. Balaam is God's mouthpiece. He is, he is speaking the words of God whether he believes them or not. And I, and I said that ruffled feathers, I said that God had overrode his free will. And, and there were people that were like, oh, God never overrides free will. And I said, uh, so you're telling me that Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 5 wanted to eat grass like a cow? That, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change my diet. I'm going to be a vegetarian for a while. I'm going to eat grass. No, God will sometimes, as a form of punishment, God will override the free will of an individual. Now, what God never does is override our freedom to choose to whether I'm going to live righteously or live ungodly. God, we have freedom of choice. But God sometimes steps in and says, but... You're going to do this. At least that's what I see in this. So he said, man, I just wish that I could die the death of the righteous. Keep your finger there and turn over to chapter 31. Numbers chapter 31. Look at verse beginning in verse 15. He said, Have you saved all the women alive? Behold, these calls, notice this, the children of Israel, now watch this, through the counsel of Balaam, to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now, now, looking at Numbers 31, what did Balaam end up doing to the children of God? What, what did he do to the children of God? He counseled Balaam. In essence, he says, and I, I'm, of course, paraphrasing this, Balaam, or excuse me, Balaam, I cannot curse the people of God. God has told me I cannot curse them, but he said, I tell you what you do. You get them to commit idolatry, and you get them to commit fornication, and you won't have to worry about the God of life on that part. And remember, that's the account that we're reading right here. So Moses says, Did you save all these women alive? Well, these are the ones that Balaam counseled. To, for the Israelites to get more to commit fornication with them. No, they cannot live. And so, brethren, yes, he spoke these words, and we'll read further into this, uh, but he didn't abide by them. And brethren, you know that there are preachers of the gospel that they can preach a great sermon, but they're not living it in their life. That's sad for me to say that. But I know of people like that. And so, uh, Balaam encouraged the children of Israel to commit fornication. Turn with me to Joshua 13. Again, keep your finger over in Numbers. But look at Joshua chapter 13. Verse 22. Joshua 13 and verse 22. Remember I said that, that Balaam would be uh, killed by the children of Israel? It says, Balaam, this is Joshua 13, 22. Balaam, also the son of Beor, the soothsayer. Now what is a, what is a soothsayer? A fortune teller, a diviner. So that's why I said this man is not a godly man. He's not a prophet of God. But God is going to use him to accomplish his will. So the soothsayer, watch this, did the children of Israel slay with the sword among them that were slain 
by them. That's right, the reason I said a moment ago, even though Balaam said, I, I wish it would be my will to die the death of the righteous, he's not going to die that death. Turn over to Joshua 24. Joshua has gathered all the Israelites uh, together. He's recounting the blessings that God uh, had given them. Uh, you know that Joshua is about to die. And so uh, he's, he's, uh, he's giving a recount of all the blessings that God had given to the children of Israel. And he says in Joshua 24 and verse 8, I brought you into the land of the Amorites which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. Listen to this. But I would not. This is God speaking through Joshua. I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore, he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. One other verse before we go back. Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy 23. We want to look at verse 4. Why is God upset with the Moabites? And the Ammonites, or excuse me, the Ammonites in verse 3. He says, Deuteronomy 23, 23, an Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to the tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever. So what does he say about the Moabites and the Ammonites being a part of God's people? No, not going to happen. Why? Verse 4, because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the cursing into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loveth thee, thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. You make no covenants with these people. You have nothing to do with them. Now that's powerful language. Why would God say, don't ever make a covenant with the Ammonites or the Moabites? Well, that generation's been dead. So now we're to the 10th generation. So why not? Make a covenant now. People don't change for the most part. Like father, like son. Uh, you know, uh, we're not saying, and the Bible does not teach, that a person cannot change. But people are what many times they're brought up to be. And that's, you remember when we talked about uh, the book of Obadiah and how that here it is, Esau's descendants, the Edomites, uh, God is going to wipe them out because they were just like their daddy Esau. And so that's the reason that these things were given to the children of Israel. So go back to Numbers 23 and uh, verse 10. We all ought to say this and mean it. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like he is. Man, that's it. You don't have to preach. Let me die the death of the righteous. Isn't that what we're all striving for? What we're all working for? To die the death of the righteous. But brethren, don't say those words flippantly. Don't say those words if you don't mean them. They don't say them, but he didn't mean them, did he? And he died by the sword. And brethren, this is serious business. You make a vow to God, 
you better make sure you're going to do it. So Balak in verse 11 said to Balaam, What hast thou done? I took thee to curse mine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. He answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? I've got to be careful. Balak, I've, got to, I've got to say what God told me to say. And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, with me to another place from whence thou mayest see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them and shall not see them all and curse me them from thence. What did he say? Remember in verse 9, <laughs> from the top of the rocks I see the nation of Israel gathered before me. So now what does Balak say? Change of plan. What do you what do, what do, what do, what do I want you to do? Go somewhere else. Don't look at all of them. And just curse this small part. Not the whole, just curse the small part. And so he brought him in verse 14 into the field of Zophim to the top of Pisgah. Why does Pisgah sound familiar? Where did where did Moses die? On Mount Pisgah. So he took him up to Mount Pisgah and he built seven altars and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And he said to Balak, Stand here by thy burnt offering while I meet with the Lord yonder. Now, brethren, does this sound like an exercise in futility? God has said, Don't curse these people. And as we said last week, when 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 Balak sent his guys down, God said, "Don't go." And then Balaam saw the money and started whining. Come on, God, just let me go down there and see what they want. God said, "Okay, if you're going to be stubborn, go ahead and go." Not not putting his blessing on Balaam doing it, but saying, and I don't want to say God gets frustrated, but it's almost out of frustration. Okay, Balaam, go ahead and go. And now you see the same thing. Well, I'm going to take you somewhere else. I'm going to show you just part of the people and go ask God what God wants you to do. And so he went to meet the Lord, or the Lord met him in verse 16 and put a word in his mouth and said, Go again unto Balak and save us. God, God is now... Again, putting a word in Balaam's mouth. you got to go and say this. And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering, and the princes of Moab with it. And Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? This Does this, it almost borders on being hilarious. What has God said? How many times did he have to say? Don't, don't, don't. You can't curse them. You can't curse them. We'll just curse a few of them. Don't curse them all. You don't barter with God. And that's what Balak and Balaam are doing. They're trying to barter with God. And brethren, when God says something once, that's enough. I don't have to go through the New Testament and find 15,000 times where God said you need to be baptized to go to heaven. God said once, that's enough. And he didn't say it just once, but he said it multiple times. And yet, what do people do? Well, go hire Balaam. Or excuse me, go hire Balaam and see if we can get another word from God. Let's see if we can get another word from God. And so, verse 18, he took up his parable or proverb and said, Rise up, Balaam, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zippor. Listen to verse 19. Brethren, these will preach. Listen to what he said. God is not man that he should lie. You want you, you think God is going to change his mind? God is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of Man that he should repent, hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Brother, that's why I say this this stuff, you know about if you want to write a devotional. If you want to write a sermon, guys, if y'all want to do some devotional and preaching, look at these statements. God is not a man that he should lie. He's not the son of man that he should 
repent or change his mind. When he says it, shall he not do it? When he has spoken, shall he not make it good? Verse 20, Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse. I can't change what God said. Yes, sir. I think the more and more we, we look at this and study it, the more and more it brings to my mind, this is a classic battle between the flesh and the spirit. Amen. Right? I yeah. Mean, and everyone in this room, I think I can probably safely say, we've been somewhere in our lives where we want to make sure that we're doing the best that we can do for God, but then we got that boss, or we got that brand, or we got that group that we want to make happy as well, and we know... Maybe God's not watching right now. Yeah. I know what God wants me to do, but maybe he's not watching. And yeah. I'm going to make my friends happy or my yeah. boss happy or my spouse happy or whatever. Absolutely. At the expense of my spiritual salvation. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, and the 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 end game is you're not gonna you're not gonna bargain God exactly. out of his word. When he said it, he meant it. He says, I cannot, verse 20, reverse. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. He didn't see if if you now watch this. Now remember, how did Balaam get the children of Israel to be cursed? Messing around, messing around with women that they won't marry. He counseled them to worship idols and commit fornication. Now watch this. God says, How can I? Curse them when I have not seen iniquity in Jacob. We could add this phrase, not yet, because <laughs> they're going to do it. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord, his God, is with them, and the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. And by the way, what does the word unicorn? Uh, that's a fairy tale, mythical animal that never existed, right? And so the King James is wrong, and we all throw the Bible out because it uses the term unicorn. Right? It says <laughs> okay. And, it, and we don't know exactly the animal that he's describing. It's sometimes translated an ox. Uh, it seems because of the word unicorn that it was a one-horned Animal. By the way, they exist still today, right? What's a rhinoceros? If it's not a unicorn or a one-horned animal. That unicorn is one horn. That's what he's talking about. So so the, these people, now maybe the drawings that we see of the horse running around prancing with the, the horn sticking out. Now maybe that animal never existed. But don't tell me that one-horned animals have never existed. We see them still today alive in zoos. And if you go to the right parts of the world, you can actually see them in the wild. And uh, just because we don't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, right? Did you see where they, uh, and this is, uh, I'm chasing that rabbit about that far. Did you see where they found the uh, fossilized remains of a, and I think it's called plethorosaurus. I don't know exactly what it is. You know, it, it looks kind of like uh, the body's got the four fins and it's got the long neck. Guess where they found fossilized remains? Loch Ness. <laughs> so, so uh, all these, uh, is that Scott, Scotland or Ireland? Scotland? Scotland. All these Scottish guys that said for years, well, we saw that animal had that long neck. You know, we see it bobbing. Maybe they weren't as crazy as we thought they were. Maybe they did see them in the past. I don't know, but I know this. He's not saying that God, like a mythical made-up animal that is strong, it brought the children, but he's describing an animal that they knew. Now, whether we know it or not, you know, it's kind of like uh, the first time you, you see, and, and of course, this is kind of uh, in our life, uh, you know, with, with television and the internet, we see things. But can you imagine what it was like the first time a European saw a kangaroo? 
You know, you think about that. What? And and I'm just here. I'm saying that you know the the native people describing this animal. Oh, that can't exist. Carries his baby in his pouch. All this, y'all, y'all are crazy. And then they see it. Just cause we, I, I said something uh, maybe two weeks ago in the men's class that I think is kind of what we're talking about. Just because it's new to me doesn't mean it's new. Because there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. Just because I've never seen it doesn't mean that we can dismiss the Bible and say, well, the Bible's wrong. It talks about a unicorn, so it's a fairy tale. No. Just because it's new to me doesn't mean it's new. And so, verse 23, surely there is no, watch this, enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time, it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel what God hath brought. So, uh, even though Balaam is trying to counsel Balaam to curse the people of God as a soothsayer, as a diviner, is that going to change God's mind? No, not going to change God's mind. Verse 24, Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion. Israel is like a lion. And lift himself up, verse 24, as a young lion. He shall not lay, lie down until he eat of the prey and drink the blood of the slain. What is God saying? Through Balaam to Balaam. Children of Israel are just getting started. They're fixing to go through this land where the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Amorites, and we could go down the Canaanites, all those acts that were there. God, he's, Israel is fixing to stand up like a lion and go through that land and nothing is going to stop him. And Balak, verse 25, said to Balaam, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. So what did he say? Just change your plan. Just ixnay everything we talk about. Just don't say anything. Just don't say a word. Don't curse them or don't bless them. And Balaam answered and said to Balak, told not I thee, saying, all that the Lord speaketh, that must I do. Balak came to Balaam, verse 27, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee unto another place. Peradventure it will please God that thou mayest curse me them from thence. And so Balak brought Balaam on the top of Peor that looketh over Shishamon. And Balaam said to Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven bullocks, seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, and offered a bullock on every ram, on every altar. What are we seeing? Same song, different verse. Same thing again. Surely, if we whine long enough, we're going to change God's mind. Is that what they're thinking? It sounds like it does. So verse 20, or chapter 24, and verse 1, when Balaam saw, now Balaam, is dense and hard-headed, but now God's starting to crack that nut just a little bit, right? When Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not as at other times to seek enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. So what did Balaam do now? This is an effort in futility to keep doing this. I realize now I can keep climbing these mountains, these hills, these uh, places of divination, and I can offer these bullets and do all that, but God is not going to change his mind. Is that what they, it finally is getting through his thick skull that God is not going to change his mind. So Balaam, verse 2, lifted up his eyes and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes. Watch this, and the Spirit of God came upon him. What does that mean? God's going to use him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Uh, again, as we said, Balaam is going to be used by God 
to speak his word, even though he is an ungodly, unrighteous, soothsaying, diviner, divinator, whatever you want to call him, God's going to use him to accomplish his will. So he took up his parable, his proverb, this is the third one, and said, Balaam the son of Beor has said, and the man whose eyes are open has said, what does that mean? The man whose eyes are opened. What is he saying? Well, let's read further and it'll help us. He had said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. So what happens when the Spirit of God comes upon him? He goes into a trance. He's, he's in a trance. His eyes are wide open. But, and again, I'm not trying to be flippant when I say this, but God is using him as a mouthpiece just like he used that God. He is, he's in a trance. The Spirit of God is upon him. He's going to speak the word of God, but his eyes are open, but nobody's home. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You understand how I'm saying that? Look at what he said in verse 5. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel. It's the valleys, are they spread forth as gardens by the riverside, the trees of lion alloys, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside water, he shall pour the water out of his bucket and his seed shall uh, be in many waters and his king shall be higher than Agag and his kingdom shall be exalted. Who was Agag? He was king, remember God told Saul go down and utterly destroy the Amalekites. Their king was Agag. You remember what uh, Saul did? Well, we've done the word of God. Samuel said, well, then what's this strange blowing of the oxen that I hear? They're supposed to be dead. If they're dead, then I'm not hearing them blow. They're the best. We're just going to offer them. Y'all know that story. And so God is going to bring Israel higher than Agag. Ahab was a pretty powerful king. Remember, uh, what was it? Did it say that of 70 kings, he had cut off their, their toes and their thumb? Why the toe and the thumb, the big toe and the thumb? Can't fight. You can't run a race without a big toe. Just, I, I don't know if y'all knew that or not. Uh, you can't. You can't. You can't plant your foot and drive your foot at least properly without a big toe. And you can't hold a sword with four fingers. Big toe has got something to do with your balance. It does. Absolutely. So, Agag, I think it was 70 kings, he chopped off the big toe and their thumbs and made them sit in his table while he feasted, rubbing their nose in it. Well, pick up your sword now and do something about it. Sort of. So he's going to be higher than Agag. Verse 8, God brought him forth out of Egypt as he, uh, as it were with the strength of the unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones and pierce them through without arrows. He couched down, he lay down as a lion and his great out lion. Who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. Now watch what happens in verse 10, and we're going to have to wind down pretty quickly. Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together. What does that mean? If you're, if you're dozing, I don't mean to scare you, but he's like, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing? He clapped his hands together in anger. It's almost like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I told you to curse them. So he said in verse 10, I call thee to curse mine enemies, and behold thou hast all together blessed them these three times. Now therefore flee to thy place. Get out of here. I thought to promote thee unto great honor. Watch this. But lo, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. Boy, I was going to make you a 
big star, but this old mean spirit of God, he kept you back from that. How many times have we heard people say something like that? It's all God's fault. It's all God's fault. I could have been, man, I could have been a movie star. It's God's fault that I'm not. I could have been a multi gazillionaire, but I'm not. It's God's fault. How many times do we hear people saying, it's a preach. Man, this is good stuff. He said, oh, I wanted to raise you up, and I wanted to give you all this honor and glory, but God said no. So verse 12, Balaam said to Balak, speak thou not also to thy messengers, which thou sentest unto me, saying, didn't I tell you this? When this whole shebang started, Verse 13, if Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord to do either good nor bad in my own mind, but what the Lord said, that will I speak. And now behold, I go unto my people. A little postscript there, you're going to die with them too, but he doesn't know that at this point, I don't think. Come therefore, and I will advise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter day. Or latter days. I'm going to quickly go through this. Verse 15. He took up his parable. Balaam, the son of Beor, had said, The man whose eyes are open has said, He had said, which heard the words of God, knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty fallen into a trance. But his eyes were open. I shall say, listen to this, brethren. Listen to this. I shall see him. But not now. I shall behold him, but not now. There shall come a star out of Jacob. If this doesn't give you goosebumps, <laughs> and there shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. Who is that star out of Jacob? Who is that scepter out of Israel? It's a messianic prophecy. Jesus is coming. He's coming. And, and Babylon saw that. I can't imagine the glory that he was able and allowed to see. And Edom shall be a possession. Seer shall be a possession of his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly out of Jacob, shall he come to have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth in the city. And he looked on Amalek, and he took up this parable, or his proverb, this is the fifth one. He said to Amalek. So he's, he's already jumped to another nation now. So all, I guess all these kings are involved in all of this. So he says to Amalek, was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he that perishes forever. Amalek, Agag, remember? Amalekites? Yeah, you were top dog for a while, but no longer. Samuel's going to see to that in about 400, closer to 500 years. Remember that? Period of Judges after the conquest. Then the United Kingdom arises with Saul. God is patiently going to wait for 500 years. But what did Balaam say? Your day's coming, bud. God is going to remember what you've done. His latter shall be he that perished forever. Verse 21, he looked on the Kenites and he took up this parable, this proverb, and said, Strong is thy dwelling place. And thou puttest thy nest in the rock, or in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted until Asher shall carry thee away captive. You think you're dwelling in a mountain? You think nobody can touch you? But God is going to send Asher. The tribe of Asher is going to come in and knock you out of your roost. Verse 23, he took up this parable and said, Elijah, who shall live when God doeth this? Hmm. And the ship shall come from the coast of ship, and shall afflict Asher, and shall afflict Eber, and he also shall perish forever. And Balaam rose up and went and returned to his place, and Balak also went his way. 
I've got one other verse that we've got to read. And, and this is, to me, the icing on the cake. Revelation chapter 2. Under the church of Pergamos, verse 12, Jesus said, verse 13, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast his, uh, my name, and hast but not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, brethren, what did he just say about the congregation in Pergamos? Where were they living? In the devil's stronghold. Now, brethren, we can look around and we can say things are bad, but I don't think we're living in the devil's house. Do you? No. The church in Burmas was. It's bad, brethren. And God says, I know your works, and I know where you're dwelling. He says in verse 14, now watch this, but I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, watch this, who taught Balaam. What did Balaam do? Why is he, why is he called in 2 Peter 2 in that great, and it's a nefarious roll call, of ungodly people whose eyes are full of adultery, remember this, who they forsake the right way and they follow Balaam, who love the wages of unrighteousness. He taught Balaam to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. What did he teach him to do? To eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. Brethren, and, and I know I went over. Does it matter what I teach? Yeah. It matters what I teach. I can sometimes say things, and I'm not talking about a slip of the tongue where you say something you don't intend. But I can say things couched in a language and it's ungodly and, and it's uh, going to lead people down the primrose path to hell. And there'll be people that just go agree. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Preach this from the pulpit. That's right. Yes. It's like uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Right. He's not talking about cars or iPhones. That's right. That's right. And I saw the God came and Tracy back there and he, you know, he sort of missed that statement. Okay. When, when it's talking about the animals and so forth, that there wasn't nothing new under the sun. And he's talking about the new test. There's no other new one to God's kingdom. That's exactly right. It is the New Testament. And, and you know, when, when Solomon wrote those words, there's nothing new under the sun. He's talking about sin and sinful conduct and the things that people do. There's, you're not, you're not going to all of a sudden come up with a new sin. But now, now God will come up with a new plan in the New Testament. Absolutely. So, uh, Brethren, the reason we need to know about Balaam is to remember how 2 Peter 2 started. Verse 1, as there were false prophets among the people of God, there will be what among you? False teachers. Be false teachers among you. Brethren, we need to know how do these false teachers, how do they, what is their playbook? They have the same playbook. I think we talked about this last week. Same playbook that Balak and Balaam had. Run it. See what kind of response you get. And if there's an uproar, you back off. 
and you wait six months and you give it again. Well, we're just going to have one little song with a little bit of an instrumental music with it. It's and we're not we're not going to do this every time. It's just going to be this one time. And people get upset. And what do they do? They back off. Say okay. But then six months later, they do it again. Or they do it that special. Oh yes, yeah, this is a special event. You know, this is not. They say worship. What are you doing? Well, we're singing songs of praise to God. We're praying to God. We're hearing the preaching. Of, but now, this is not a worship service. So it's okay for the ladies to do this. It's okay for us to have instrumental music. In the old story that is true, the Methodists, along with most major denominations, oppose the use of mechanical instruments of music in the worship of God. And you know where it started in the Methodist church? This is true. You can do the research. Did you start? Yes. He was asked, well, what do you think instrumental music was? Piano or something. He said, I don't have any problem with the piano being in the church as long as I don't have to sit or listen to it. That's exactly what he said. He said, I don't have a problem with piano as long as I don't see or hear. Mm -hmm. That's the founder of Methodism. Don't have a problem with instrumental music as long as I don't see it and I don't hear it. But they started out with the kids in the basement singing these songs, these worship songs, playing instruments. And then lo and behold, I guess it crept up one step at a time and it came all the way up the stairs and out of the basement and got right in the auditorium. And now it's full-fledged band. Now, brethren, we need to know these things. And you need to know that if you're not a Christian, that if you, you can say all day long, I want to die the death of the righteous. But if you're not living the life of the righteous, you will not die the death of the righteous. So if you're not a child of God, Brother Don's going to be leading us in an invitation song. We're pleading with you to respond to the gospel. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you, want to, if you as one of God's children wander away and you need to come home, please come and stand and ask for something.